we are back on the Zero Hour. I'm Richard R.J. Escal, and our guest for the next uh, section of the show is Dean Baker, who is co-director of the Center for Economic Policy, Economic and Policy Research in Washington, D.C., and whose blog, Beat the Press, tries manfully or, or faithfully or courageously to correct the many, many economic misperceptions communicated by the American media. He has written about this uh, phenomenon this of uh, Thomas Piketty and Piketty's ideas ideas and, and what they mean for the progressive movement. Dean, thanks so much for coming back and joining us. Thanks for having me on. So listen, uh, you wrote a great, a couple of great pieces actually on, 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 on uh, you know, I've been pronouncing it Piketty, that's right, it, or is it Piketty? I hear, hear both. I, I think it's Piketty, but I won't, won't I, swear to that. Yes, well, I, I think he knows. I'm not. He may be the only one on, the, on this continent who does for sure. But anyway, so so Piketty, um, you wrote about his book Capital, and, and in essence, how should uh, progressives respond? And uh, I'm tempted to summarize it, but uh, I'll probably just mangle it. So, I mean, maybe just in a few words to start off. Uh, what's your reaction to to the book and to the reaction to the book? Well, my reaction to the book is I thought it was a fascinating book. You know, there's a lot of great data. P- people may not be familiar with Piketty's prior history. He made a reputation along with uh, one of his main co-authors, Emmanuel Says, for mining the tax data in the United States. If this seems obvious to people, like why didn't people use the tax data, it's hard to do. You can't, it's available to the public, but it takes a long time. You know, we, we can't just go down to the IRS and say, give us the tax files. You have to go through a long clearance process takes quite some time, but then you have a massive amount of data. The reason why this is important is that this is actual data on particular individuals. So we know how much, and I don't know whether he has Bill Gates, he could figure out who he is from, you know, the names are blocked out. But the point is we could figure out exactly how much money different people are getting. Most of our other data sets are surveys, and they're generally top-coded. So that means we have Bill Gates there who might get, I don't know his income, we'll say a billion a year, and then we have someone else who's a successful lawyer gets four or five hundred thousand. All we see is top code, and meaning then, meaning that puts down it says top code or it won't say top code bill. It'll say you know gives some code six 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 six, and we can't tell that Bill Gates had a billion a year in income and the lawyer had four hundred thousand. We just know that both of them are over the top code, which is something like four hundred thousand. Depends on now, the survey. And, and- and my, uh, just to jump in for a second, I, I think there's an important policy aspect to that, too, as well as an analytical aspect, which is, if my understanding is correct, and you'll let me know, the reason why they are classified as quote-unquote top code is because the person earning 400000 and the person earning a billion are both in the top tax bracket, so they're taxed at the same rate. Is that correct? Well, no, they're not top code for the tax purposes. We have a variety of surveys. You know, when you get the unemployment numbers every month, that's a survey. There's another survey that the Federal Reserve Board conducts on on wealth. There's a whole set of surveys that various agencies conduct, and those are the ones I'm referring to as being top coded. On the taxes, they're not top coded, but we don't have that. That's see, this is exactly what Piketty did. He arranged with the IRS that he would have access to the actual files. Again, he's not getting Bill Gates' tax return, but he's getting the information from Bill Gates' tax return. And so he's getting the figures. That's right. Yeah. So, that, that means, yes. okay. that, so the point here is he could figure out what's happen, actually happening in that top 1% or so. If I'm using the survey data that's publicly available, all I could see is, okay, we had you know a million people or whatever that were in this top code, and we don't know how much money they got. Now, what Piketty did with that was he was able to see, oh, look at this. When we talk about the top 1%, they've really pulled away. So they had much more income there than we had realized, and particularly the top tenth of 1% or even the top hundredth of 1%, there's been a really great divergence with those at the very, very top making out like bandits. So that, that was his contribution before this book. Now, when he did this book, he goes back and he compiles data on wealth for the United States, dating back in some cases to... You know, the pre-revolutionary war period, he goes to 18th century France. So it's an exhaustive account that brings up to date, you know, our understanding of wealth and income patterns, you know, for the last two centuries in in much of the world. So in that sense, it's a very, very useful book. Now, what's gotten the most controversy is he's saying, okay, going forward, what should we expect? 
And his argument is that, you know, if we expect the future to be like the past, then we'll see a further concentration of income. So he tells a story that we saw an unusual period in the middle, uh, middle of the 20th century across the United States and much of Western Europe, where we saw income becoming less concentrated, but we should expect it to again become concentrated as we get, uh, you know, through the rest of the century. It's called the volume called Capital for the 21st Century. So his, his uh, expectation there is that we'll see greater concentration. And, you know, it's kind of a bleak picture in that respect. And he says, what can we do about that? And he suggests having some sort of wealth tax that, you know, will tax the wealth of these very high income, well, very wealthy people. Now, I want to just, we're talking with the economist Dean Baker, and I just want to make sure that the audience understands, uh, which is why I may at times play even slightly dumber than I am. Um, and that is, um, and that is Hess's. Obviously, you know, here's a guy who we, you know, so many of us got so much out of his work on in, income inequality, where really the dramatic story I think people didn't understand was the inequality within the, the highest 1% themselves, how the 0.1% and the 0.01% are also pulling away at dramatic rates. But his book wasn't called Income in the 21st Century. It was called Capital in the 21st Century, meaning that, as you alluded to, he changed his focus. He changed changed his area, broadened his view at least to include the accumulation of wealth, not just differences in income, right? Exactly. Um, and it really, it, it talks to a large extent about wealth. And, you know, there are stories that, you know, wealth is more concentrated than income. I mean, you take the bottom, I'd have to check the exact number here, but 30 or 40 percent of the population has zero wealth. Uh, almost no one really has zero income. Pretty hard to imagine, you know, where you're living in if you have zero income. So poor people, but even they have positive income. But we have a large segment of the, the population literally has zero wealth. They, in many cases, negative. They owe more than you know whatever assets they might have. Um, and then you have the top end, the top one tenth of percent, top one percent that have on the order of taking them one percent, some on the order of thirty or forty percent of all wealth in the country. So you have a greater uh, concentration of wealth than you do of income, and that is really the focus. And he argues we should expect it to become further concentrated in the decades ahead. Great. Well, what I want to do is um, is is break open a little bit that that maldistribution of wealth just for a couple minutes. We need to take a quick break now, but when we come back. Um, and thank you so much for sticking with us. I want to talk a little bit more about that maldistribution of wealth and not just income. Uh, we'll be right back with economist uh, Dean Baker. I'm Richard S. Oh, oh I, I just got uh, instructions not to break away. Great. So let's just keep going, and they'll 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 edit that out for posterity. Um, Okay, so we're talking about the maldistribution here of wealth as well as income. And, you know, there's an equation that, uh, that he uses that's become uh, quite uh, notorious at this point. R is greater than G, meaning that the ret if the return on, as I understand it, that the return, if the return on capital becomes greater than overall economic growth, this, this massive over-accumulation among the few becomes inevitable. Is that a reasonable way to paraphrase his findings? That's right. That, it's, it's a fairly simple story, you know. So people who have wealth, they're seeing that grow more rapidly than the economy grows. So then, you know, their wealth is rising relative to income, relative to other people's wealth. So what we, so basically, what he's saying is that we've reached a point where forces have a kind of momentum is underway that if we don't, you know, I, I, I've likened it, at least in my head, to a black hole, you know, where you reach that, that, that point of no return and then the singularity starts forming. There's no stopping it unless, unless something more powerful intervenes. I think what he's basically saying is that a very few have, an, uh, have amassed an enormous amount of wealth. That, that wealth is able to grow faster than the economy as a whole. So unless something is done ever increasing because whatever you want to call it oligarchic wealth and power becomes inevitable and will get progressively worse that's right and you know i think i would argue he's overly pessimistic on that score because you know to my view i've seen you know just to, to put as simply as possible he looks at the equality we saw in the middle of the century, you know, not just the United States, but across much of uh, West Europe, much of the world. 
he looks at that as sort of an anomaly. Um, I don't see it as an anomaly. I see that as, you know, we learned a lot about economic policy uh, that we didn't know previously, Keynesian economics, to put it bluntly. And also we had the growth of the labor movement in the United States and elsewhere. Um, so we had both political force and a changed understanding of the economy. So, you know, my view is telling me that in, you know, the 18th century, the 19th century, the rich were getting richer. It's kind of like, you know, I, I sort of like this analogy. It's sort of like saying, well, you know, we shouldn't expect our kids to live past five because, you know, we can go back into the, you know, the Middle Ages and the 18th century, and most kids didn't live, pa- live past the age of five. Why would you think kids could live past the age of five? And I go, well, we have modern medicine now. We understand, you know, the things that would cause, you know, infants to die. And, you know, I think that's a good argument. And I would say it's the same sort of story, you know, when he presents evidence from, you know, he goes back in some cases 2,000 years to antiquity. And I go, okay, I, you know, it's fascinating evidence and worthwhile for many, many purposes. But I think there really is a changed understanding of the economy that allows us to, to grasp the levers in a way that we didn't previously so that we don't have to see the same sort of concentration of income and wealth that we apparently saw during that period, at least according to his data. Now this is this is a fascinating topic. We're talking with the economist Dean Baker about the the new book Capital by Thomas uh, Piketty. Um, this is a fascinating uh, topic because you know you have someone, and I'm certainly not uh, you know picking on him. Paul Krugman has been extraordinarily generous and gracious in his praise towards uh, the book Capital and towards uh, Piketty's work. Everyone has has benefited greatly from his research, but but uh, you have a, a, a certain number of Keynesians who used to say, as Krugman has said many times, this isn't rocket science. We know what to do. But they're also embracing a book that in effect says, well, yeah, but what you know to do doesn't work anymore. So without really, uh, that I've seen addressing the idea that, um, you know, is he or is he not refuting the techniques that we have seen work in the past and can we embrace the book and yet reject those, that aspect of it. Uh, yeah, I actually had an exchange with him. I was on a panel um, at the Urban Institute when he was in town last week, and I had an exchange with him, and, you know, he, he, he said, you know, he didn't have evidence. He has beliefs about this, and I can't say I have airtight evidence, but, you know, I, in one of my, actually several of my comments on the book, I pointed out all the ways in which we have government policies that prop up the, the incomes of the wealthy, and these are policies that can be changed. So, you know, one of my favorites, uh, you know, if we talk about the financial sector, we have two big-to-fail banks, and the, the International Monetary Fund just came out with estimates of the, the implicit subsidies to the two big-to-fail banks, the, the guarantees from the government, I should say, to the two big-to-fail banks. They estimate it was $50 billion a year in the United States and $300 billion a year in the Eurozone countries. Those are huge. Those are very large relative to corporate profits. That's just one policy. So we're getting into the the aspect of the discussion that has to do with policy solutions uh, Piketty may have uh, not emphasized properly. And and we'll get more into that when we come back from this break with economist Dean Baker. We're talking about uh, Thomas Piketty's new book and the discussion of inequality in in the United States. We'll be right back with Dean Baker after this break. I'm Richard R.J. Escow, and you are listening to, and this is... The Zero Hour. 